for. So he'll be sharing some stories along the way. So uh, if you could go to your emoticons and give a virtual round of applause for a duck, uh, that would be fantastic. Already seeing questions streaming in. We're seeing people okay. in the Zoom so uh, room. So um, Douglas, uh, glad to have you here with us tonight. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like maybe let's start by telling me a little bit more about like, uh, you know, what what is change that management in your definition? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, thanks for the invite and hi everyone. And um, yeah, we had uh, Dale and I had a good meetup last week talking about change and. Uh, so the one thing you said in the introduction uh, struck me because you mentioned about COVID. And actually, uh, I think over the years, one of the things I, I've, I think about is that change management is actually it's a competency. So, you know, we think of change management being, a, you know, going from point A to point B. But actually, as an individual, as an organization or a team, we can get better at learning how to go to point a to point B. So next time we get better at it, if that makes sense. So we, we can all think of ourselves and all think of our organizations and the ability to do that. So I, I would say it's both a event driven, a ch an individual change, as well as a, a competency to be good at understanding this. And I think this is what we're going to explore a little bit in this time. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? That makes yeah. perfect sense. I think uh, it sounds like it's a skill. Uh, it needs to. Uh, yeah. It needs to be. Uh, it needs a certain degree of experience. It needs to be practiced. Uh, it sounds yeah. like there is some knowledge and skills involved uh, in the process. Yeah. So but be careful by asking me to tell stories. I have too. <laughs> I, I'm told I have too many stories. So if I tell, yeah. if I start telling too many stories, everyone just put yeah. thumbs down or something just to keep me on track. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Uh, that's what I'm here for. Okay, I'm gonna okay. try my best to channel my inner Oprah uh, as I, right. as, I joke, as I joke and tell people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, yeah, it was great. So let's start off by actually, you know, bridging this um, uh, two subjects between user experience and, and and change management and how how I think it's kind of related. Yeah. So in a lot of the work uh, we're we're doing in user experience design. We take a look at customer experiences. We took, take a look at um, changing and modifying or optimizing experiences uh, within the organization, but also uh, externally facing as well uh, towards customers and towards prospects. So uh, would you, would you uh, comment, would you say like OD is, is quite internal focus in this case? Uh, is there any sort of cross uh, overlaps between the two disciplines, uh, knowing that you have also worked with a lot of um, UX designers uh, in your career. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if this makes sense, everyone, and, or and Dalen, but I, I, so OD is also, uh, OD is focused on the health of the, inter, of the organization in order to serve the greater good, the outer good. So it's both, we all just as a simple definition would say, uh, help the organization be have more impact externally and more health internally. Um, uh, and I think the similarity with UX, because we work quite closely with the design thinking folks, uh, they don't like, we, we try not to call ourselves design thinking OD, all these uh, different terms. Uh, but I think one of the things that we all realize is that uh, if, if the change doesn't get implemented or it's very painful, uh, we, we wanna make it a little bit easier for, for people to accept the change, whether it's internal or external. So for example, when this InnoLab in, in public service would often come up do the, all the, the UX stuff and all the, you know, the studies on people come up with recommendations and early on found out that the organizations were not implementing a lot of the solutions which made sense for citizens and, and for the ministries. So then the question became, well, how do we increase the, uh, the acceptance? Most of the time, the solution is, is, a, is, a, is a reasonably good solution. So how do we up the acceptance level um, so that people are more likely to implement the, the ideas that we have, I guess would be the, the thing. And, you know, and I feel like there's two or three different ways to do that. So one is to get people involved up front, you know, get more people involved in what is it going to take to make this happen. So we've done lots of projects with uh, 
I, I remember like uh, Tomasic Poly, uh, MCI, where instead of coming up with a plan and then and then saying, let's roll it out, they were like, why don't we get a few hundred people involved in designing the change? So now everyone owns it, right? You don't have to, you don't have to sell the change. So I don't know if everyone here can relate to that. So that's one level, get people involved when it makes sense. And the other one is if we know it's gonna be hard, then how do we involve people more in working their way through the change, if that makes sense. So, well, the Dale in a story that we talked about last week, um, well, yeah. if I, am I, am I, it's okay to tell two quick yeah. examples about yeah, that Yeah, of one? course, go ahead, so examples the, are great. So the way I think of it is, is at one level it's, okay, here's the thing. If we have a really good solution and we know that if we give it to the organization or the users or whoever it is, and they're gonna implement it, then we just do it. Right, it's quite simple, um, and if we can never have those situations, it's it's great. Right? Um, but let's say we don't have those two things. So one is one choice we have is like I mentioned, get people involved in creating the strategy, in creating the solution. The other one um, would would be if we know it's going to be hard, then how do we get people? Then we know we need to work harder at getting acceptance. Um, which we're going to we'll talk about in a little bit, but um, like one one example I mentioned, Adele, and and it's it's always nice to have some examples where um, a lot of the work I do anyway, we don't have tangible uh, uh, evaluations. We don't know 100% for sure that there was the results, right? The tangible results, but every once in a while there is. And here's two quick ones. So one was many years ago. Anyone here remember Keppel Totley Bank? KTP, Carolyn, Cheryl, I bet you have no idea. Um, Dalen, you didn't know either, right? I, I didn't I didn't know. I mean, just, just a little bit of context for our overseas friends. So some of the examples that uh, Douglas mentioned earlier, there are uh, institutes of higher learning, that's Republic Polytechnic, and oh, right. MCI is uh, Ministry of Communication uh, in Singapore. So Capital okay. Tutley Bank is, um, it's, 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 it's one of those old banks that, that no longer exists, but I'll let Douglas continue the story. Yeah. Thank you. I will be more careful. Apologies, everyone, for that. Um, I'll be more uh, conscious of that. So when Keppel and Totley Bank merged into KTB, was it called, um, they realized that the banks had not had been the same for a long time. Like Totley Bank had been around for 25 years, family owned, no change. So they knew that it was going to take a lot of effort to get into this integration because they'd never done it before. They, they hadn't done a lot of change. It wasn't a competency they had. So Accenture did the systems work, but then a couple of us um, did the, the change and transition work. And we worked very hard because they knew that they needed to do that and have in order to have a successful integration of the two banks. Make a long story short, the year after they integrated, the the one bank combined made more money and had higher like engagement scores than the year before when they were two separate banks. So it's always nice to see at least a little bit of evidence that what we did and the change really helped people. Um, even when they weren't used to change, they managed to do that. So that was quite nice. We did lots of workshops, booklets, all kinds of things. Did you have with... a rough timeline of this, uh, Douglas? This was between, uh, oh, I know yeah. it was so in the 90s. Is a, yeah. This is before you were maybe, was it, oh, you were born, I think, 97, 98? Yeah. yeah. 97, so that that's, that's during the Asian financial crisis, I remember. That's right. And that's kind of why they merged because there was a thing about consolidating the banks and then they got swallowed up uh, within a couple of years by another bank, I think uh, United Overseas Bank. One yeah. more recent one, but similar story is uh, uh, the Ministry of Social and Family Development a couple of years ago came up with this idea to identify the, the most uh, financially vulnerable families in Singapore. And they came up with this really great plan to do that. So uh, instead of people having to navigate the government, each family who was identified would have a social worker attached to them. So you know, if it was Cheryl, then I, if I'm a family that's in struggling, I don't have to call all these ministries. I call Cheryl and say, Cheryl, can you help me? So it was a great plan. And we had nine agencies involved, but we also know that nine agencies all coming together and coming under the same plan was quite difficult because they all have their own schemes to help, you know, poor and more vulnerable families. 
So boy, did we work hard. We, that was, I think it took us six to nine months and worked at all different levels, the very top level, the director level, the people on the front line level. We had them come up with processes. We had them, you know, and the staff showed them videos so everyone would cry to make them feel, you know, more, uh, you know, um, related to, you know, to the families that were struggling and help them reach out. And so, so that program, I, I mentioned that particular one because they researched the families that were identified, the, the few hundred families, and measured how effective the program was for the families. And it was quite a, a stellar success. Mm. And if I could add one more change management angle to that, which I, I tell this story a lot, and it's really helpful. One of the agencies, when we started this six or nine month uh, change management process, right, to get all nine agencies involved, I, I won't mention their name, but one of the agencies was so resistant. Every time they came to one of these things, they were like arrow, they had to con, they were like, why are we doing this just because your minister announced it? You know, why do we have to join? We have our own ways, we help people and all that. So they were quite resistant. But because of all the work that was done by the team at MSF and uh, my colleague Christian and I uh, supported them uh, and did lots of workshops and bring, bring these uh, large group interventions. That one, that one agency that was so resistant and like really didn't want to be part of it, once they got it, they became the biggest champion of the project. So they actually got an award after the three year three or four years, the three years, I guess it was, they got an award for being the most supportive agency. And it's a really good lesson for change management because some of the people who are most resistant up front, some of the people or the teams or the ministries or organizations, once they get it and they see that this is a good thing, they become a great champion. So I, I, I think it's a good lesson not to write off people just because they're initially, uh, you know, um, struggling a little bit to get on board. Yeah. So as you were uh, telling the stories, Douglas, I, I noticed a few overlapping themes, right? As a yeah. user experience design practitioner oh, and uh, ed educa educator and myself, um, I noticed the fact that you have this spirit of collaboration, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. like involving people in the process of change. That seems like uh, one of your key strategies to, to allow change to happen and to take place more easily or to That's meet right. less resistance uh, in the process. Yeah. Um, and you also mentioned a couple of other things uh, like being able to empathize with um, the experience of change, right? Uh, putting yourself in the shoes, uh, in their shoes particularly, mm -hmm. and, and trying uh, yeah, uh, to empathize with them, but also asking, uh, requesting them to empathize with others uh, in the process. Right. And and that yeah. that actually that uh, process of actually facilitating that and and maintaining that uh, degree of empathy uh, sounds like quite a key uh, driver in in terms of uh, instituting these these changes. Um, would there be any other additional points you you would add? Uh, you think that that are quite key to the success? Yeah. Oh, that's a very good connection. So please let's keep doing that, finding the intersectionality, sure. right? Um, of course. Uh, I think, I think empathy is one thing. And I, I think understanding the, the, what's the right word I was going to say, I, I would say understand the systemic things that get in the way of making these things happen, right? So understand the system, the parts of the system involved. So for example, the one I just mentioned with uh, Ministry of Social and Family Development, what, what it really came down to after lots and lots of talking to people was the challenge that they faced was the, pro the form that they had to fill in and submit into MSF. So there's the empathy to understand where people are coming from. And then there's the understanding of where, where are the blockages? Because there could be an emotional blockage, but there's also very practical blockages, which they may not be conscious of you know, off the top of their head. But they're, they're, yeah, there's a concern about how are we going to do this? Who's going to pay for it? All those stuff. So you have to understand. I think it helps to understand the, the the landscape. The ecosystem is a word I think is quite useful. Does, yeah. does that also have some overlap there? 
Yeah, it does definitely have some overlap. I often tell my students that uh, designing an app, designing a website, it's like designing a system, right? Running a business is like designing a system too. So um, definitely uh, having a, a systems level type of thinking and understanding and looking at the big picture, looking at how parts interconnect with each other. Right. Uh, is certainly a very important skill. Uh, one that's not often stressed enough because we're, uh, we're, we're often in the solution mode, right? Or we're often in sort of like a blaming mode. Then we get into like a particular issue, but we fail to look at the bigger picture uh, right. in this case. Yeah. 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 So let's, let's get into the, um, the how, right? Let's get into how, how, how should we do this? And we actually have um, a question in the chat, you know, um, if let's say you're new today, right? Let's say you know uh, very little about change management. You're new to organization, but you have a strong desire uh, to help change your organization for the better because you really believe in the vision, the mission. Um, you know how how do I get started as as an executive, right, or as as a manager, perhaps? Right. Um, well. Um, that's a that's a simple question and a big question, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Indeed. So you're talking. So, so I would say uh, to if there's something that you're really passionate around, I think it also depends where you are in the organization, right? What level you are, um, and what level of urgency there is in the system to change. So I would say those are two factors to start with, right? So if you're a very senior person and your organization is feeling a lot of pain because of the competition or because of what else is happening, your chances of being successful in promoting a change is quite good. If you're a lower level and your organization, everyone is feeling quite happy and complacent and we're doing okay, then you need to be a, you know, a black belt, right? In, in order to promote the change. So th there are a few dimensions that, that make a difference, but I would start with, um, yeah, what is the change that you think that we each think would be helpful? And then test, and I, I wouldn't go this on, on our own, right? I would say talk to other people that are like trusted colleagues and find out, you know, what is this that, uh, is this a good idea? Who can we, who else? Um, I, actually, I got a call about two weeks ago from somebody who works in one of the FSCs and he's young and he's smart and he has all these ideas for change. Do you explain he, what's a FSC again? Oh, sorry, I did it again. A family <laughs> service center, so they okay, provide got it. service. Okay, got families. it. No problem. Okay. And and uh, so he feels all by himself, and he's trying to do all these changes, and he's banging his head against the wall, and he's having a really hard time. And so I told him, so find find the two or three things that you think are most important. Talk. To, do, I said, do you have anybody in in the organization that you're? This is a small you know, maybe 40 people or something like that. Do you have other people that, you know, young like you and, uh, you know, um, a little bit want to do things differently? Talk to them, find one that you all agree on would be something really useful and helpful. Then maybe talk to somebody more senior that you think would be a, a listening ear and give you guidance. And that way you can start into some of the new schemes that they had in mind. So I, I like if you're if you don't have a, a change in mind and you're saying you want to make changes in your organization, um, I think that's a good place to start. Because mm. if we all work in an organization, we know things um, are not perfect, right? So we, we find things that are close to our heart. I remember when I first started working uh, AT and T uh, many years ago, and, and when I first got into OD, I thought the biggest issue was. Um, that the way we promote people. So the way we promoted people back in the day was as long as you kissed up to your boss, you could get promoted. Even if you kicked down to everyone else, you could kiss up. So I went to the president, I used to go to the president and say, Ken, Ken, we need to do a change. We need to have a better way of promoting people. We need to make sure there's a board or we need to do a 360 or we need to make sure it's not just one person promoting pers people, you know, like all that. So that's what I did. That was that was probably the first big change that I that I tried to do. Um, so I did manage to get the ear of the president, but he told me, well, you know, Doug, you have to understand things take time. And it did take a few years, but finally we did implement a better solution for that um, to about how leaders get promoted. So I would say all of us here have issues, right? That 
if, if we work inside or as a consultant, if we're working external, we see opportunities. And I say, this is not a stuff we do on our own, right? We, we have to reach out to other people and, and, and form, form a little coalition to, uh, to get things done. How does that sound? That sounds great. I mean, uh, that, that, that also relates to a lot of the research and readings I've been uh, encountering, right? Uh, essentially, there was this story of the burning platform. So when, when you talked about how urgent the problem is, it, it really resonated. Uh, and I can yeah. certainly see uh, how, how it's important and plays a big part in yeah. driving change or, right. or even triggering that change process. Uh, I was just wondering wait, as- Wait, can I just yeah. sneak in something? Go for because it, this is, go for it. No, no, this is, a, a, it's kind of fun and, and somewhat important. Daryl Connor, who's the guy who created the term learning platform, he is on a I'm campaign to tell people do not use that term as loosely as it gets used because the story of the burning platform was a guy literally standing on a ship that was burning and he had a choice whether he should die burning on the ship or jump off into the cold ocean. So he said it wasn't really much of a choice. It's, it's like die or at least have a 10% chance of living. So he said, you really need to um, be careful not to use the term. I have a video of him saying that. So he says, be careful about burning platform and it has to be really burning or you have to create a little heat, right? Um, so I so I just, thought I, yeah. I, I heard that once and it kind of stuck in my mind. Yeah. I, think, I think that uh, that makes sense. And that's quite an important distinction as well. Because... Uh, yeah uh what what somebody sees as burning is also um perceived quite differently from another Very person so, uh, sorry like, to interrupt but yes what yeah, question? Go, uh, no i i think i think as i as i mentioned uh, as you were describing the story um what i what i did observe uh was that one of one of those key things that related um to that and uh there was a follow-up question uh in terms of you know, change management and how, how you started uh, as well. And I, I think one, <laughs> one of that was that, um, how do we spot symptoms or how do we spot uh, when an organization's ready for change um, or, or, or an organization is not ready for change? Is there, is there any way we can, we can tell like without, uh, you know, trying to play a doctor or anything like that? <laughs> Well, I think it's quite helpful. And maybe I do this too much. I mean, I do lots of mergers and change. So I've done so many, so I have a few different lenses. Um, uh, but I would say, I, I like to do it where the organization says they need to change. So let me, so I'm actually working very on a live project with an organization that is about to go through a change. And so, um, and they're, they're doing okay. So they don't have any burning, their platform is not even warm. So the question, so if you know that, so here's one tool for if an organization is doing okay and nobody feels a sense of urgency or the burning platform, whatever, then we need to work harder to get people to see that for them to say, yes, it would be good to change. That to me, that's the key. I, I don't think it helps to um, you know, tell people you need to change, let them come to their own conclusion. So one of the tools, and we're gonna send a paper after, after this that has yeah, this thing called the S -cur an S curve. And in an S curve, you see that um, if you, sorry, if I draw this on, a, on my finger, it's probably not very helpful. But if you know, if you know this uh, nice model, like really, really important model, and so you, uh, you, you, you have a new job, a new relationship, uh, a new product, a new service, whatever that thing is, and struggle in the beginning, and then you go up the curve. And eventually, if you don't re-inject something new, um, that you go down. So you know, if you, if you don't uh, upgrade your services, if you don't upgrade your product, the organization, then you go into decline. So the idea is to start a new S-curve before you go into decline. Make sense? The problem is, if you try to go on a new S curve and you haven't gone into decline, then everybody in the organization is like, "Why are we changing? We're doing fine. Why are we Why are we trying to break something that's not broken?" Right? So I, I'm working with this organization, but I know that's what people are thinking. So then I'm going to introduce this model to them, and they're going to talk about it, and then they'll be able to say, 
okay, right, this is the right time for us to change, to go on something new. Does that make sense? So, yeah. so if if it's important to change and there's no urgency to change, then we have then it helps to get that the organization to see, like this S curve. Anyone, I, I think this is a great activity if you. Uh, if you do work internally or externally with an organization, I take ropes and I put the S curve ropes and, and we're gonna send you an article if you're not familiar with this mm. S curves by uh, Charles yeah. Handy. So I put the, the uh, ropes on the ground. I explain what this S curve model is about. I, I usually ask people to raise your hand. Um, there's not that many people I can see here, but I'll say, how many of you ever changed your job because you felt like you were getting a bit stale and you wanted to try something new, or you tried a, you tried a new hobby or a new thing because you felt like you, it was time, you know, to start something new. Almost every hand in the room goes up. I said, so you understand S curves. You understand the principle that it's good to do a new S curve, right? So when they, when the organization, when the people, when they stand on the rope, many people will say, yeah, we're doing okay. And I think let's try something new. Then, then it becomes so much easier to do the, the change, right? Um, uh, like that. The other, the other one that I do sometimes to get the organization to wake up to change is I'll do like a, a one to 10 scale. Uh, how fast is our environment changing? You know, and then people say, oh, you know, somewhere between three to eight or whatever. And then I say, okay, how fast are you changing internally to meet the external environment? Then they, usually they go much lower. And all of a sudden now the 50 leaders of an organization are looking at each other going like, wow, we're not doing very good. We better change, you know? So um, I, I just find it's, it's good to have lots of these little tools to help people to, for not, because the top, it's always the top, per, not always, but usually the very top person is, is the one, you know, pushing for change, right? Um, mm. And the resist the people who are like very happy. They're the ones who've come up to the organization. They've been around for a while. They're doing a good job, and they're the ones who, okay, boss wants to, you know, you know, have another change. Okay, la, well, I guess we'll go along, or maybe this CEO isn't going to. Be, maybe he'll be uh, transferring soon or posted out. So maybe we can wait this out. So it's it's just good to find lots of tools for the where the organization says we need to change. And, and so, of course, sometimes change gets imposed on the outside, like a merger, mm. or we, you know, some of that does happen from the outside. But in general, it's always quite nice if, if people own it a bit more. And then yeah. if they don't own it, then, uh, and, and it, it is imposed, then how to get them involved in the how and understanding the transition. Yeah. Mm. Could, I, could I say that it is possible to get people to change whether the platform is burning? Uh, or it's not burning, whether, whether there are external factors involved uh, or not, it is possible to institute change. Uh, would that be an accurate uh, yeah, statement? I think, well, having done this for um, many years, yeah, I, there's, I, I, think, I think hopefully if you're on this call, you've seen this happen. And Dale, I'm sure you have as well. So yeah, yeah. So, if it's, so I would say if it's the right thing to do, then, um, and people, can understand that that is the right thing to do, then, then yeah. sure, why not? So this is great because I, I mean, sometimes people know intuitively it's the right thing to do, but uh, they don't do it or they, they find it really difficult to do it. And I'm sure many of you can relate to that because I've been in organizations as well who resist change, right? Despite uh, best intentions, despite best efforts, despite CEO trying to drive the change, um, it's still is difficult. But one of the things I picked up when, when you were um, describing your process earlier is this, is this on a very meta level, what you're really helping them to do is to see and, and understand and, and gain awareness right, uh, of, of themselves and, and the organization at large. Um, yeah. And I often say, even as a mindfulness uh, practitioner, uh, gaining awareness is often the first step uh, yeah. towards, towards change. Uh, yeah. Without, without self-awareness, without awareness, um, there, there is no possibility to, to change, right? I mean, some of you are coaches over here. You can, mm -hmm. I, I think you can certainly relate to that concept. Um, yeah. Did you have anything to add? Well, um, 
I think we can all relate to this, right? Because um, if we've ever, if any of us have ever done a thing like I'm going to exercise more or eat healthier, um, uh, then it comes down to the self-awareness to know yeah. what the targets we're setting for ourselves are reasonable, whether we, we have the discipline to do it. So if we've been on 10, we've had 10 commitments in the past that we're going to exercise three times a week for, for, for 20 minutes or whatever, and we tried 10 times before and we didn't do it, then we need to work a little bit harder to get, you know, to, to, to create the, 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 the infrastructure, the support, or the thing to, to, to actually do it, or maybe start off and just say, I'm not gonna do this for the rest of my life. I'm gonna do it for the next two weeks and see how it goes. I'm just gonna commit for two weeks, right? Yeah. And if I could add two more points about change, um, I think it also helps to understand the psychology of change. So I mentioned one already that the people, and I feel like I want to invite other people to share too, but I guess we don't have a lot of time. But so I mentioned one that the people who are initially most resistant often become, and this is, there's research behind this, uh, often become uh, the champions once they get it, you know, once they believe that it's the right thing to do. The other two that I think are good to keep in mind is uh, Barry Johnson, who's like the guru of polarity thinking. He says, and I, boy, do I see this a lot in the public service and even in private as well. There's this thing about we need to change, we need to change, we need to change, we need to transform. And actually Barry Johnson, the polarity guy says, actually, it, it actually slows down uh, the change or the transformation because we just keep hammering away this message of we need to change. And we don't often put in there what's not gonna change. What is going to stay the same? Our our values, our principles, our 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 our, um, our commitment to our customers or our citizens, and, and and we've done this before. We can do it again because it'll help us be better, or whatever. So he says that if we just keep pushing the message, we need to change. Um, it's actually counterproductive. So and he's also written very extensively about that. So that's one to understand, and and maybe that's the one of the better things I did in my 10 years in the public service was um, to tell, to remind people and the leaders that we need to do that. We need to say, what's, what is staying the same? That's one. So when people get change fatigue, um, it, it's very real, right? So how do we make sure we know that things are going to stay the same and we're going to do this together? It's not like the corporate leaders, I hear a lot of them, you better change or else, you better get on the bus or else I'm gonna find you, I'm gonna kick you off the bus myself. I've actually heard CEOs of big Fortune 50 companies say that to their staff and it's terrible, right? So it's also the narrative. So the good ones will say, we're going through a major transformation. It's gonna be hard. Um, I hope you come on board, but if your life circumstances don't um, allow for this, I totally understand and we will help you know, find you, find another job, get you whatever support that you need, um, because it is going to be a lot more time and commitment. You're going to have to learn a lot of new things. So there's lots of things to understand about narratives. And um, if I can think of one more quick one, and, and Dale and we talked about this last week, the difference between a change and a transition. Mm. So William Bridges, if anyone knows his work, and I, I don't know about you, but I just find it amazing. And this is this why you titled this uh, Building Bridges? What was this? Thing? Oh, yeah, no. yeah. Bridging Change. Bridging Change, Bridging change right? Because I just think this guy, William Bridges, was born to do transition work, right? Because what could be a better name for somebody who's going to do transition than have a guy named Bridges, right? So he, he, he has written the books on this, right? And I think many of you would have seen his stuff. And change and people are often not afraid of the change going from point a to point b they're worried about the, the how how do you do that right so um for example the very simple one i shared last week when we were talking was moving house so if you know you're going to move to a bigger place or somewhere more convenient to work whatever it's like oh great you're going to you know get go to a new if you've ever moved and hopefully you've moved to a place where you got you felt that you were in a good space um that's not an issue, right? So you know that you know a, a six months later you're going to be more comfortable in your new place. However, the moving, the moving boxes, the timing of signing, you know, of all the documents and uh, 
and the SP power and the PUB bills and the address stuff and and also like what happens if you want to move to a place but they didn't they didn't sell their place yet and you need to have a place to you know to rent for two months while you're waiting and so it's the transition that's more painful and it's the same thing in a lot of organization changes learn people once they learn a new system they're fine you know um, but the learning part how do we support people through the learning new ways of doing things? So there's lots of, to me, it's a lot of understanding the psychology of change for people and, and, and really walking them across um, all through that transition or over the bridge, so to speak, to the new way of being. Mm. I, I fully agree with, with what yeah. you just described. And it reminds me of, um, of a passage I, I read from um, a book um, about management. And they talk about the idea that as a leader, you're you're in the you're in the eye of the tornado, right? Right. In the eye of the tornado, you're you're kind of like in a very calm calm space and calm spot. But as you're instituting change, right, um, and and you're going from one uh, one level and you're extending to all the levels, um, your employees, your team members, especially at the lower lower levels, are gonna feel it a lot more uh, because right. they're. Uh, because you're at the center, you don't feel it much. It, it's just like a snap of a finger. But then, as you're going uh, further and further from your from your leadership team to your uh, employees and, and ground staff, uh, they start to feel it more, and they start to feel a little bit more disoriented, or they they feel like the swing is really really huge. Do you have any, you know, um, tips, or do you have any uh, ways? Because you 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 say good CEOs communicate well, right? And and they mm -hmm. bring people through that process. Is, is there any uh, general principles or approaches um, to kind of bring, uh, I would say, these ground level people along through the journey? Um, well, uh, I have seen leaders do pretty amazing things um, and, and understanding the, what, what the impact that people have, right? So, um, so not only are they in the the eye of the tornado, but a lot of senior leaders, or I don't even know what a senior leader is, anybody who's been in on the planning of the change, they have been through the cycle and they've already been through the, oh my goodness, we're gonna change and what's gonna happen. And, and they get to the point where they're like, okay with the change. And then when they announce it to the whole organization, then they expect if they don't have that empathy and emotional intelligence, social intelligence, emotional intelligence, they expect everyone to go directly to, you know, to the new structure or a new way yeah, of being. So it's like right? my way or the highway, right? Something like that. Yeah. So the ones that don't get it, um, that's, that's kind of how it comes across. So I, I think it's a matter. And, and that's why I think change is a, is a competency for, you know, any leaders, um, or anyone, actually anyone, but anyone, any leaders, any organizations. And there was, and I, I was an adjunct for uh, faculty for Center for Creative Leadership for many years. And they did some, uh, they do lots of 360s and they relate them to profiles like MBTI, FIRO, different profiles. And one of the studies that they came up with, which I, uh, when they correlated those two, which I thought was quite interesting. And these are all these things are I just, whenever I have worked with organization, just give them all these, the data and the stories and the S curves and don't be one of those people that expects everyone to change just because you told them to change, you know, all that stuff to walk them across. Um, anyway, what they found is the, the, lead, the people who scored higher on, in the competency called leading change were more likely to be extroverted uh, in the MB and the Myers Briggs uh, type inventory, so I tell that to leaders all the time, and then I say very simply: if you're, if you're an introvert, this is not that bad of news. What do extroverts do more than introverted leaders? And they say, "Yeah, they talk a lot more." And I said, "That's it." So when it, if your people are going through a lot of change, you need to talk to them, and you need to find out how they're doing. And and I, I have the model. Well, the article has the has the model of how to do that. But that's what you need to do. You need to be more visible. You need to connect with people. You need to find out what's happening with them um, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's great. Uh, I've already shared the article uh, in the Zoom okay. chat. Um, for those of you who are tuning in on Facebook Live, uh, if you like the article, please uh, just send us an email or something and we'll be happy to send it to you. Um, and as you were uh, describing, as you were talking as, as well, um, 
that was a quick question from the chat. Oh, yeah. And okay. uh, Jan asked, what are your favorite books on OD change management slash leadership? I know you already mentioned some, like, uh, would you mind just sharing like some of your uh, top three favorites, perhaps? Top three favorites. Mm. Okay. Um, so the transitions one is, um, is, is clearly managing transitions. I mentioned the guy, uh, William Bridges. Um, leadership. Um, I personally like um, this Patrick Lencioni's book called The Advantage, um, which is about organizational health. I don't know, I, I raise hand if anyone's read that, wants to recommend it. Um, because this guy, if you're not familiar with this guy, Patrick Lencioni, he wrote eight management fables, um, like stories about being a leader. And then he kind of put it all together into like, and it's very easy to read and just dense with, with, with uh, insight. So I would, I would say that is another one. Um, I don't think I would recommend, well, the, the book Immunity to Change by Bob Keegan and Lisa Leahy is also a very good book, but it's, there's a lot there. So I, I, I there's a HBR article that they wrote called uh, The Real Reason People Won't Change. I think that's a if I, that's probably searchable on Google, and it kind of gets the point about this unconscious piece. I would also look for um, the Barry Johnson stuff about stability and and uh, change. Um, again, I think it's pretty easily uh, go, uh, you can Google or whatever search on it and find it. So th those are a few that um, come off the top of my head. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. Uh, I think uh, everyone's got extra books to read uh, this <laughs> this uh, couple of months uh, now. I, there are some books I haven't actually heard of myself, so I'll I'll, I'll be sure to read them. Um, and just to bring back to uh, our point of discussion earlier, as uh, we're talking about change and and principles, uh, I know I know you're going to do a longer webinar. Uh, to share some additional frameworks. Uh, do you want to give a preview of what you're you're going to cover in in your webinar or what you're going to cover in your OD workshop that you're Oh, you mean like the yeah. one next week for the OD network? Uh, yeah, the, the one next week by oh. the OD network and also the, yeah, or your OD workshop. Yeah, since we have a couple more minutes. Okay, so the, and if anyone has any questions, yeah, put them in the chat. So well, that, actually, I see a lot of, I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm helping you with that. You're, Don't worry okay, you're, you're so, curating. Yeah. yeah. Um, so two of the concepts that are really close to my heart in the, in the field of, of OD are uh, use of self. And I, I think in all the work we do, right, and, you, and when we're trying to help organizations, help people, is who we are. It's not just what we do. It's who we are that does it, right? So... Um, uh, Bob O'Brien, this uh, Bill O'Brien, uh, the CEO, he says that the, the impact of any intervention we do is is related to the internal state of the intervener, of the person that we bring. So use of self and understanding who we are, not being judgmental, all the stuff that goes into that. So there's that, and I'm kind of like kind of like you know Reese's peanut butter cups, you know where the somebody was walking with a jar of peanut, uh, a, a chocolate bar and they tripped and the chocolate bar fell in the air and landed in a peanut butter, a jar of peanut butter and they ate it and were like, wow, what a nice combination. So, um, I, so, I, so I put this use of self thing together with one of my, what I also think is a really useful way of thinking about organizations, which is levels of the system. So the self, and then also how do we interact with others and how do we use ourself to, to intervene and in, with other people, with teams, and then also with uh, larger systems, you know, communities, large organizations. So it's an exploration of, of uh, use of self at different levels of the system. Yeah, that's great. Know, uh, okay. And we got the event bright link uh, right okay. in right in the Zoom chat. So uh, if you okay. if that piques your interest, uh, maybe you can okay. hear more from Douglas. That's happening next week, right? Uh, next, next Tuesday evening, and the price next. is right. And as the show says, the price is right. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and I I heard I hear that you're also organizing or rather you're uh, facilitating a, a two day workshop. 
uh, with with Kai Singh, uh, one one of our common contacts uh, right. on in March. Can you can you talk a little bit more about what 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 you intend to do? So uh, just to say that uh, Christian Chow, I don't know if anyone knows Christian. So some of you know Christian. Um, we we really brought uh, OD uh, education and understanding organizations into the public service. So a lot of people outside the public service were wondering like what what can we learn out here? So Kai Seng was the one who approached me and said, well, can you, can you uh, put something together uh, for designers is what we came up with. So um, we're gonna do this thing in March for two days, uh, the 10th and 11th of March where we're gonna do the organ. If anyone here has heard of Barry Oshry's organization workshop, it's a experiential like three quarters of a day to understand how to see an organization as a system or it's one really powerful lens to do that. So we, we do that on the first day along with something called the consulting style matrix. So we look at our, we look at the system and then we look at our relationship to the system. So that's day one. And then day two uh, um, is the getting to the process of how do we do OD? How do we do, um, the, it's called the action research, the seven phases of the OD cycle or action research, which we have worked quite closely with uh, Alex Lau and the InnoLab uh, in, in, in the government to, to complement OD and, and design. So we're thinking that's gonna be quite useful. And Kai Seng, just like you and I did here, He's, him and I are gonna do a dance between like working with big organizations doing organization development and communities and what it means for the design community. So that's what we're planning. Yeah, I, I mean, as designers, I'll say that um, we, have, we have change management is, is uh, the unwritten part of our job description. Right. Uh, it, well, why is it unwritten? Why it's unwritten it? because, like, the organization wants us to do a lot of things, uh, including research, design, and testing, and even like scaling operational efforts uh, at times. Uh, but also, uh, they don't realize how hard it is, right, to help people okay. to understand what uh, the language we're speaking. And that's that's also the point when we're talking to our enterprise customers. We say, hey. Uh, we wanted to help you get better at customer experience fluency, right? Because we believe that this is a language that you need to learn uh, and not right. everyone understands this language. And there's a process, there's a mindset, uh, there are some skills you need to acquire uh, in order for everyone to practice it well, uh, as you have mentioned earlier, uh, that it requires practice. Right. Um, I was just wondering out of curiosity, when is the right time uh, an organization should bring in an external consultant to help with change. Um, yeah, from your mm. experience. So I, I mean, it's kind of, it's really ideal if there's if the internal folks. I mean, if they have a role where there's internal people that can do it, that's great. Um, I guess one, if I if I think of the two organizations in Singapore that I in my mind are, have the best OD capability um, would be uh, EDB and Tan Tok Seng Hospital uh, Economic Development Board for those of you outside Singapore and the Tan Tok Seng Hospital and have very 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 strong internal consultants who can do lots of the change projects and because they know the business they know the people and they're very skillful. Um, and they're a really good example where they do most of the internal stuff. And every once in a while, they bring in somebody from the outside to either disrupt the system, you know, who has a different perspective, or maybe somebody who's like a really like a guru, like a Peter Senge or, 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 or you know, of somebody that kind of gets people's attention. So they don't, it's not just them talking about it all the time. So I, I would say to, um, yeah, to, Build up as much internal capability as possible, um, and if and if you're building, so here's the other thing: is when you're building, uh, if 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 you're an internal and you're hiring anybody from the external, whether uh, I would say shadow them if they're good, shadow them and partner with them and do it as a part an inside outside partnership, because if you hire a consulting company, for example, and then they come in and do the work and you have not learned from the process, 
then it's a real missed opportunity. So whenever I work with the ministries or companies, I try with everything I can, like I'm doing stuff with AIC, um, some stuff with them. And it really works out great because the internal people and, and myself would partner and, and, and with, we craft our messages and what's helpful. So that, and, and hopefully they're learning, right, as, as well from the process. So I, I think inside, outside, is, is a nice partnership um, and, and, and the process of building up the internal capability. Mm. Does that I, answer that? Is that a question? Um, yeah, I think, I think it does un answer uh, the question on when to bring in uh, a consultant. Uh, sounds like it, it, it requires a, um, an understanding uh, and sensing uh, if there's a need for someone to come in to challenge the status quo, uh, that, that seems like a yeah. good time. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a term in OD really quick. I'm not sure if you've heard of this and I think mm. it's just a fun term and I know we're yeah. coming up to nine o'clock and um, yeah, sure. uh, uh, Jonah Hannafin is his name and he came up with this concept called the perceived weirdness index. I don't know if anyone heard of it called PWI. If you Google that, I think you can find it's a brilliant article. So if you hire somebody from the outside and you hire somebody who is like looks and talks and sounds the same as the people inside, then they may not get the attention. You know, they may not grasp people. If you hire people who are really super weird outside the, you know, they come in with tattoos and earrings and all kinds of stuff and they dress kind of wild. If they're too wild, the system will reject them. So you want to find, and, and, and he uses this as a very strategic, when he goes to meet with clients, whether when he used to be an internal, now he's external, when he meets with a client, he checks on his PWI and he'll talk to his team and say, how weird do we need to be to get their attention, but not be too weird that they reject us. So I think that's a, a nice thing. So I, some of the organizations I work with, they, they, when they go to look for external people, they really look for PWI. Like one, one organization, one friend that I know, when she feels like her organization needs shaking up, she says she finds Australians. I, I'm not really exactly sure why, but she says that the Australians come in and they're loud and you know, they're whatever. And she says, they're the ones that the, the, the like, they, they, they're, they're disruptors, you know? And she says, <laughs> Doug, I can't hire you because you're too nice. <laughs> which i'm happy i have i i don't but she, yeah I mean, she, she says it as a she that, says it as a joke right kind of but but it makes sense right because i fit into the system even though i'm and i look different i've been here a long time and a bit nice and all that whereas what she wants because they have all the internal capability so if, if she ever does hire external she'll hire somebody who's really different to come in and get the attention of the system which i, I think is a wonderful strategy yeah I think I think that's great. Uh, and I mean, since we started late, we still have a couple of minutes. Uh, I was just one. I, I recall when we were chatting, uh, you were mentioning our our ministers or rather our uh, the way Singapore government functions and the way we communicate change is is actually very strategic. Right. Uh, you, you, you talked about the ERP example. So do you want to you want to talk a little bit more about and GST hikes and all that? So, so you want to share a little bit more about that? <laughs> So I, I think this, for those of you who live in Singapore, I'm sure you could appreciate this. And outside Singapore, you can decide uh, how relevant this is in your own context. Um, but for many, many years, uh, and I think it might be wearing off a little bit of uh, the effectiveness, but uh, the, the, what the government tends to do, the ministers, prime minister, is announce like, we're thinking about a hike to GST. We're thinking about casinos. You know, We're thinking about whatever. Um, and they just keep repeating, oh, you know, we're going to talk to some people forms and get some feedback and hear people. And, and, you know, after hearing that message for a year or a year and a half, it's like, you know, if it makes sense, or at least we understand why it's being done, which of course is part of the messaging, then when it happens, it's like, okay, la, we just do. So I always found that quite clever. Um, although, like I said, I think it's, uh, maybe not, it doesn't work as well as it used to, you know, people are not as obedient as we used to be, right? So, um, uh, but I, yeah. I think it's quite interesting. It, it has, it has that. worked for, for a number of years. Right, let's, and let's I think, and, and, and I, even though it, it's like a fun thing, I also think there's a legitimacy to it too, because I do think they reach out and get opinions from people, which is why casinos turned into integrated resorts and 
there were some things, the casino regulatory authority was set up to manage that, you know, so I think it, it's, it is legitimate in that, in that sense, but it is quite an interesting strategy. So anyone, we can use that with our families and stuff. Well, we're just thinking about this, you know. That, that sounds like pre-framing. That sounds like preempting people. Uh, <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is, like, isn't it? And now, now it goes back to to me, uh, my sales sales and and all that experience. So that okay. that's such a wonderful sharing. Um, and before we end off, I'll I'll just like to uh, give you the opportunity to maybe share some last words or final words of advice uh, for all the change agents out there. Uh, if they're working internally in the company, what, what would be some of your final words of advice for them? Mm. So I would say when we're making, so I don't have any magic words of advice. I think I've already talked too much, but the, I, I think when we're trying to uh, change an, or, an organization, it's hard work. And I would say uh, two things. One is of course, take care of ourselves. Two is um, to be curious about why it's going the way it's going. I think that's the other thing. And I would say, if we really feel like we're burning out and the system is tired of the change, if we can take a couple of weeks off and take a break, I don't mean take like go to the beach or something, but if we can like take a week or two and back off a little bit and take care of ourselves and, and let the system percolate a bit, um, of course, it, it doesn't affect things like milestones and all that, but that would be good. So I would say let, let's uh, take care of ourselves. Let's stay curious and, um, and, and appreciate the beast, you know, the, the complexity of the organization that we are um, facing. So that's my quick thoughts, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's okay, super important. Right. Uh, it does, definitely sounds right. And as I, as I also relate to some of these, because I, I speak regularly with some of these leaders who are part of the change, and they tell me change management is like a, a side gig for them. Like you have to do your actual job and then you have to do the change management yeah, work, yeah. especially if you're internal within your organization, which is why I say like UX designers, you have to do what you need to do as a UX designer. And then you need to do what you need to do uh, that that's outside to help uh, help the organization to shift. Uh, and you're right. Uh, it can it can it can burn you out it, because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of energy to hold that space uh, for other people. Uh, and it's super important. And on your, uh, yeah, sorry, you wanted to elaborate? No, I was going to ask you a question. So if you want to finish that, and if, by the way, it is after nine, if somebody, if you, obviously, if you need to drop off, go ahead. Yeah, but, we're going to end very soon. Yeah, yeah. sorry. But, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about your second point. Can you elaborate a little bit uh, further? Uh, I believe you mentioned other than, yeah, I, I can't quite recall, but. Be curious? That yeah, one? being curious. Yes. Oh well, it, it kind of relates to our, our name, <laughs> but yeah. Oh yeah, be curious to the core. Um, <laughs> yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. <laughs> so uh, Kurt Lewin, who's the guy who's credited for founding the field of organization development, he he said that if you want to understand a system, try to change it. Right. So when you try to change a system, you get feedback. Right. Um, and it comes in all different forms, right? From all different uh, people. And, and, and so it's to be curious about why people act. It's just data, you know? So maybe people are not resistant to change, but they're comfortable, they like safety. So why should I, is this really worth a risk or whatever? So I just be curious. Sometimes the people who are most cynical about change actually used to be very idealistic. But over years, they've been their their idealism has gotten beaten down, and now they're more cynical. So, I just think it's good to be uh, helpful for our, also for our spirit, our soul, right? Um, and to keep it a bit lighter um, and and be curious about why things go the way they go, rather than being judgmental of, and making up stories about people about why they do what they do. I mean, I know that's a natural tendency. And if there's a humor, sorry, the extra one, which um, I don't use it. Actually, I, I think I do use it a bit. But if, if anyone needs to go, sorry, because I know we're running over the, the time and all that. But I didn't know, had no idea what change management was. But when I was a young, uh, I was in IT for many years at AT&T. And we went through the biggest divestiture in the history of like the world of organizations. We went from one company with over a million full-time people 
to eight different companies all split up. It was a massive change, right? So the new organization, we used to go to all these big town hall speech uh, things, and they would always show a video that was quite funny to get people to like lighten up a little bit. Like, for example, there was one where this very official guy, you know, he was like, I'm the senior vice president and I'm here to talk about the change. And, you know, because of the change, we're thinking we're going to uh, have a new name, you know, because uh, AT&T has been around for 100 years and we're reinventing ourselves now with these all these new companies. So everyone, we've decided to change our name from AT&T to something that stands for, you know, excellence. So we're now going to be called IBM, which at the time was like the the, you know, like the best company in the world. So can you imagine every time we went to a town hall, they would show videos like this, you know, they were funny and got people to lighten up a little bit. So I, I do think there's something about- But, but, but they are not, they are, they, are, they are a joke, right? It's not, they it's were not joke. meant to be treated yeah, correct. seriously. They were a joke. Okay. But I think, right. so in that case is, but I think also just to keep it light when we can too, because uh, I don't mean take it lightly and, 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 and dismiss how people are feeling. But if we if we get too stuck in how people are feeling and, and, and if we yeah. over empathize to the point where like, oh, my goodness, we shouldn't have done this. And, oh, I feel so sorry for you. And that's not very helpful either. So how do we walk with them? But at the same time, keep it um, light, yeah. if that's the right word. Yeah. And with that, I think uh, that's that's great. Like keeping things light. <laughs> Thank you for uh, staying throughout the one hour uh, webinar. And uh, we have Douglas over there uh sharing all all uh he has known for over the last uh i don't know over the last 30 over years uh and and it's great um obviously i can't i can't put uh everything out there if that if you're interested to hear more from him uh he's doing two events one um which is a free event next week uh which is a webinar and the other which is a workshop in in may where you get to spend two days with him um and this is and great kai and, kai uh, and kai sing and kai sing so this is great. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you again next month for the same segment. Um, and if some of you would like to stay around, uh, we'll we'll do maybe a 10 minute uh, off the record okay. kind of like thing. All right. So, so thanks, Dale, for the invite, everyone. I hope